Welcome everyone to the very first episode of this podcast, which is a series of conversations with scholars who research video games on an academic level. We talk not only about the current and ongoing research of these academics, but also about the field of video game scholarship in a broader context. And with that, my very first guest is Jan Schwelk from the Czech Republic, from Charles University. Jan, thank you for accepting my invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Just a bit about Jan. He's a game production studies scholar who is based at Charles University at the Faculty of Social Sciences. He's also a member of the Prague Game Production Studies Group, which is also based at Charles University. And it is a group of researchers who are focused on furthering the research of video games at the institution and also beyond it. Jan is very prolific in the research he has done on video games. He has written not only on game production studies, but also on video game voice acting, on monetization, a very contentious topic nowadays, and also on paratextuality, which was covered in his doctoral thesis. And last but not least, he also does research on tabletop games, Magic the Gathering in particular. Jan also has more than 10 years of experience as a freelance journalist, writing about not only video games, but also about music. And if all of that were not enough, he also plays guitar in a band. <laughs> Welcome again, Jan. It's very nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. And regarding our topic, I'm going to talk to Jan about his study normalizing player surveillance through video game infographics that appeared in the June edition of New Media and Society by Stage Publishing. And in this article, Jan problematizes the practice of popularizing the gathering of players' data by sharing this information or parts of this information with the players themselves, usually through various entertaining metrics, such as infographics with various charts. But before we delve into any of this, Jan, I have given a fairly dry rundown of your CV. Could you maybe tell me what led you to becoming a video game scholar in Central and Eastern Europe, maybe at Tross University in particular, because this is definitely not a field that would have been burgeoning, let's say, 10 years ago. So how does one become a video game scholar, if I may ask? Yeah, I think it was, uh, it's, it's still, I think, quite difficult to become a you know, full-time video game scholar because kind of the infrastructure isn't really there. So it often requires someone, you know, some pioneers to you know, break the ground and allow others to pursue this path. And for me, I think it was largely my older brother who wrote his PhD, you know, many years before me about the history of games. So I think it was something that maybe was a little bit more approachable also for the media studies department because we have a strong tradition of uh, kind of history of media at our department. So I think that kind of bridged those two things and made it more acceptable also for the rest of the faculty to kind of go along with it. And as this progressed, we had some courses about games and it became much more normalized. And I think that, you know, students are always excited to write about these things because they are oftentimes very near and dear to them. So, you know, once there's this interest, there's also a need to kind of educate yourself if you want to teach those things. So I think it's still quite difficult to go in that direction, especially if you want to you know, go into PhD and into the later stages, but it's getting definitely better and games are becoming more acceptable as a field of study, even in Central Europe. Recently in Prague, we also had a game design program open at the film faculty of the Academy of Performing Arts. So also in from other kind of avenues, it's becoming easier to do this. This is, you know, definitely an important thing. And the Czech video game industry is also quite, you know, successful. So it makes sense to study it you know, on an academic level. Good. Thank you. It's always nice to hear that the field is becoming more and more established. Now, since your article deals mostly with player surveillance, could I also ask you to give a brief historical rundown of how the gathering of player data has changed over the decades? Because the way we play video games has evolved a lot, and it's not like publishers were always swimming in the amounts of data that they have right now. It has changed quite a bit. So could you maybe give an overview how this has evolved over the years and decades? So I think like it's a fairly recent development uh, that you know developers are able to collect data and remotely and then analyze it then they have access to these big data methodologies as a way of assessing player behavior so you know in the early days of the you know video game industry in the 1970s there was no such way to oversee and collect data about what 
people are doing in the game. So there have been experiments with qualitative focus testing, having people play games, and then observing them and also going to arcades to watch how people play. But this is something that players could easily avoid. You know, if you played in the privacy of your home, then uh, you were out of the oversight or surveillance capability of the developers. So it was much, much more private activity back then. But with the growing capabilities of the internet and kind of the evolving technological infrastructure, kind of network infrastructure, and the popularity of massively multiplayer online games, it has become more common to kind of already has this infrastructure to allow online play. And then kind of this comes together with the ability to, you know, monitor what players are doing in the game, because then it suddenly also becomes important for governance of in-game activity and making sure that people are not cheating, not breaking the game. So it has some very practical implications to be able to see what's happening within the game. And with the seventh generation of consoles, I think, with Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and at the same time, we had digital distribution platforms like Steam you know, coming up. This online distribution networks can be also used to kind of collect data much easier because a lot of these systems that sprung around these platforms already had some sort of surveillance aspect to it. I write in the article about achievements as this very innocent looking aspect of uh, surveillance. And it's a special case because players have access to the data. It's not entirely processed internally by the game companies. So also people can make use of the data. Players can learn about the game and how others are playing. So it's slightly different than, you know, the more shady ways of analyzing player data. But yeah, I think around that time it's becoming much more common. And now we can see it's kind of spreading across all different types of games. So now all sorts of games that wouldn't even need it kind of collect the data because it's so available. Kind of the technology is already there. The mindset of developers is very much data driven. And there's been also a lot of interesting work just written about this data-driven design and optimization from Jennifer R. Whitson and others that kind of pursue this move from games as products to games as services. I think it's kind of a big part of this evolution and why data plays such a big role in how games are made nowadays. It's interesting that nowadays, even if you play single-player games that have no multiplayer component whatsoever, you still need to be online most of the time. And what's worse, you may even need to install a launcher and every publisher nowadays prefers to have their own launcher. So maybe you install two or three programs before the time that you even start the game and your data is being gathered by two, three places simultaneously. Yeah, and sometimes it's unexpected. And you know, even though the studios give you the chance to opt out from data collection, you know, a lot of the data is already collected as you're launching the game. So it's, you know, maybe not as detailed as some of the things that make it into the infographics, but it's already, you know, some data that the developers can use to optimize the games. So a lot of these things kind of happen even before you launch the game, you know, through Steam, through these launchers and other things. And engines themselves, I know that Unity was collecting data kind of, that was the automatic way. If you didn't kind of tamper with the engine settings, it was sending some data to the company about what hardware are people playing the game on and so on. Speaking of what is actually being done with the data that companies have gathered, in your article you mentioned that there seems to be at least to an extent this reciprocal relationship in which companies share some of the data that they have obtained with the players. And it's usually happening through these attractive infographics that are in the visual style of a certain game, or at least a studio. And mostly the metrics that they present are these harmless fun facts, as you call them. So could you tell me what the conclusion of your study was? What kind of data and information are studios and developers sharing with players? And does this information serve to improve the way players play the game or does it serve a completely different purpose? I think there's like these two big uh, genres of how this how this type of data is shared and one of them is the are the infographics which are kind of the main focus of my article and these are kind of meant for you know general audience it doesn't have to be even the players of the game although sometimes you wouldn't be able to kind of understand what some of the metrics mean but these are often very simple metrics 
like the number of monsters killed, shots fired, all these diff- very simple things that you know are trivial for the developers to measure in the game and are very much only scratching the surface of what developers are kind of interested in monitoring within the game. So these are fun trivia facts about the game that uh, can make it into you know, news articles, you know, social media, and then they are shared. And for the people who are invested in those games, maybe something that they can you know, uh, chat with their friends or kind of compare how their own player behavior compares to some of the stats. With story-driven games, there's often these uh, percentages of which choice is more popular than the other if you decide to save certain character or save the other one. So I think it's also, for these games, it's also a way of making kind of these choices apparent to the players. Because aside from infographics that are shared you know, outside of the game, in the specialized press, on social media, there are also many games that kind of share this information within the game, like Telltale Adventure Games, Life is Strange, uh, Detroit Become Human, and the games from this company. So here they can also serve kind of as a as a reminder that you have this choice and you maybe haven't tried the other story path before. The other thing is that there are these player dossiers. It's a term that's used for these more personalized statistics in games that are more kind of competitive, where you're really trying to improve your skill, improve your strategy in playing the game. So these, I would say, are definitely more useful for players because people can draw some insights and information to maybe improve their skills. So the information in these player dossiers would be, let's say if you play a shooter, how accurate your aim was, etc. So really nitty gritty statistics that are supposed to directly improve your play style, right? Exactly, those things. And uh, yeah, different kind of effectiveness of different weapons and all these other things. Like maybe you've kind of realized that you've been doing the best with certain things based on this information that you've been given by the game. So this is definitely more useful. But a lot of the infographics are just social media fodder that like you can spread around. And it might be interesting for some people, but doesn't have much value. And it's also just a tiny part of the data that is collected by companies. And I think that's one of the findings that I've discovered in the studies. A lot of the more complex, but also more controversial aspects of games that are part of the you know, telemetry systems and that are definitely observed by uh, and surveilled by the game companies, they don't make it into infographics. And it seems that companies are very much aware of the things that may be, might be problematic when shared publicly. Although I would say that there are certain exceptions when the game is doing well enough, then you can share kind of these uh, maybe more intimate or more sensitive data, like active, you know, active players and all these things that are maybe harder to assess otherwise. One of the examples that I'm using in in the article is about the the Diablo three infographic, where they kind of share a lot of information about active players, which is something that you usually don't see aside from being able to glean this data from Steam. But this always just paints a very limited picture of of the landscape because if you have multi-platform games, then for consoles, you don't get access to the data. As you mentioned, some of the use of data is more benevolent than other uses. And you have also shared some infographics online, which were mostly also part of your study where developers showed in branching narrative games what kind of choices a certain percentage of players made or which characters were the most popular in RPGs. So these uses seem fairly benevolent, but you also warn that if you are expecting these fun facts, then you are essentially signing off on giving over your information more and more, and you are normalizing surveillance. And it would also be impossible to talk about surveillance without at least mentioning monetization. And I know that it's also the focus of some of your other research. So could you maybe elaborate a bit on how this immediate player data can be used by developers and how much its availability is influencing their design choices? If you look at any kind of more practitioner-oriented 
you know, book or you know, articles that have been published about game analytics. The key performance indicators that are often, you know, this is the term the industry uses for these metrics, are often kind of retention and kind of metrics related to monetization. And those don't appear in those infographics that are shared. And these are very much business performance related metrics. And those are kind of the most important for the companies. They are kind of part of the business intelligence and they might, you know, get more into detail when you're looking, for example, at you know, virtual goods and how much you sell of a specific item in the game. This is something very important if you're a company and even if you're maybe not selling functional microtransactions or maybe just selling cosmetic items like in league of legends you have skins for different heroes or, and many other games are implementing similar microtransactions it's really important for the allocation of resources within the development team to see that maybe this skin is doing well it's for a specific character then we're gonna you know pay our artists to make skins for this character because you know, they are selling well. We're not going to make skins for the character that no one really cares about. And this is something that really then directly ties player surveillance into economic performance of the game and kind of extracting value from the data to improve the profitability of the game. This is something that suddenly, you know, it becomes more kind of problematic. You're not just collecting data about how what players are doing to understand what's happening in the game, but you're turning it into profit. And the compliance of the surveyed subjects is becoming problematic. And how we approach it, if it's really encouraged by the companies and they don't give you, you know, enough information about what's being done with the data. This is something that's also why I have this argument about normalization. So once you get used to the idea that surveillance provides these fun facts that you might be looking forward to or like to read about, then maybe you're more willing to surrender your data to the companies. And of course, this is, I'm looking at the infographics, looking at the where they're constructed. So in my article, I'm not really talking to the players and how it affects them, but drawing on other studies from surveillance studies area, which have talked about how this, just this presence in general discourse suddenly normalizes surveillance because people are kind of getting used to it and they don't object as much as they might otherwise if there would be more critical voices in the specialized press about these things or in gaming communities. I recall you using the term covalence in the article at one point and we really did get used to being able to see how our friends and millions of other people are performing in the same games that we are playing. And it's incredible how we're actually seeing the data of millions and millions of people. And as you have mentioned, it, it's sometimes even gamified. So in games like Detroit Become Human or the Telltale games, it's even integrated into the game itself, seeing the percentage of people who have made one choice or the other choice. But even though we're seeing the data of millions of people here, and it may appear like mass surveillance, it actually seems to be one of the least problematic ways how this data is being used. I think like with certain games, like sharing your data, it's more a question of privacy, like just purely of privacy. Like you're not being exploited specifically. They're not turning your data into profit, you know, directly. So I would say like in these story-driven games, of course, when the whole community kind of submits to it and shares the data, everyone's kind of getting something out of it. And so of course, in that specific case, it's not as problematic, but... We know that like these telemetries are very much pioneered and improved due to the, the games as service uh, titles, which are using it for generating profit and these more uh, you know, problematic means. As a whole, it's always kind of hard to maybe looks too clear cut uh, these distinctions, but yeah, in specific games, it's definitely less you know harmful. Like you're not being manipulated by giving. Uh, telltale your information about what choices you make like they probably you know it's hard to even uh, think about whether they're gonna adjust what's happening in the next episode based on the data it's maybe more for the players to have and i think like covalence in games it's also i guess gives sometimes players access to you know fairly sensitive information about the you know popularity of the game in terms of uh maybe you see that suddenly 
uh, the game isn't completed as much as other games. And this is something that probably the studios wouldn't really want to tell you, but because there's already this system of achievements and trophies is very much kind of a part of how player communities, what, what they expect from games nowadays. So you kind of have to have a trophy attached to completion of the game. But then this gives players information about how many people have finished it. So in certain cases, it might be in a way revealing to the general audience but a lot of the data is proprietary unless it shows the company in good light they're not going to share it publicly right so yeah yes it goes almost without saying that you're not going to release an infographic boasting about how much your game has failed that would be terrible pr and we did speak a bit before we started this podcast about the case of cyberpunk which has been viciously parodied by its fans because the game was such a letdown so after the studio has released infographics about how many players have bought the game, how many enemies they have killed, etc., players have actually gone through the trouble of mimicking these infographics and they made their own statistics about how buggy the game was, how much of a letdown it was, how many features were missing, and then even adapted the color palette, the graphics and whatnot of the infographics. They really put in the work and it was this really, really vicious fan feedback. So it goes to show that these campaigns can maybe misfire if your game is not perceived good enough or worthy enough. Yeah, that's a really uh, funny example. And especially like, yeah, with Cyberpunk, there were, you know, many controversies connected to the game. But yeah, then it's you're kind of really running into the creativity of players, what it can do. When you're boasting about something in the game that's not really, hasn't really performed up to the expectations, yeah, you're you know, exposing yourself to critique very easily. And as far as data gathering actually improving games goes, I wanted to ask your opinion about early access games that have become really popular in the past few years. So these are essentially games where a chunk of the game is released to the public before the game would be ready, and then the developers are finishing the game based on that feedback. And the most positive example of this would be probably Larian Studios, who are behind the Divinity series and who are developing Baldur's Gate 3 right now who are famous for releasing a limited chunk of their game a few years before the final release and then polishing the final game based on the feedback and the data that they get from players for this. And this seems to be working well for them, but is there maybe a potential for exploitation here? Because you are essentially using players as unpaid interns to finish your game. Even though in the case of Larian, they have been getting much, much better games for it. So. What do you think about this practice of letting players help finish your game with their player data? I think it's a really interesting case and like there are many other examples. I think it goes back to these like really old discussions about critical political economy that looks at you know different user generated content and just user participation as kind of exploitable activity and that it provides free content or free labor to media corporations. And of course, you know, in a way that's true and early access games are outsourcing, you know, a lot of the things that quality assurance uh, departments would be doing. But at the same time, I think players are often very willing to put in the free labor to be able to um, kind of influence the development of the game, to make it, you know, much more to their liking, to fulfill their kind of expectations. and. There's been work, you know, in with Fallout communities and how they wanted to interact with Bethesda and you know other examples. So there are like more ways to look at it. So it, it's a difficult case, and it always depends on how the specific company is uh, treating their fans and whether they're kind of listening to their feedback or just are using it to kind of bug fix. Are they giving players enough kind of agency in the design process, and are they listening? maybe to more kind of qualitative opinions, not just, you know, people are, you know, having difficulty passing certain things. So we're going to adjust the difficulty or are we going to change the quest because people are not happy how we've represented something in the game or something like that. So uh, I think then we have to really look at you know, the specific cases and how it's implemented. There's also an important distinction. I think that also David Murphy makes in his article about this Call of Duty, update debacle was published in game studies it was a 
patch that nerfed some of the really niche play styles that revolved around uh, quick scooping, which is this you know trick when the player you know, scopes in with a sniper rifle very quickly and then kind of abuses and exploits the auto aim assistance in the game. So it's a way of abusing sniper rifles more as a close quarters weapon also. So this is something that one patch uh, for Call of Duty has made it weaker compared to other play styles in the game. And there were uh, big protests online from people who were using it. And uh, kind of the justification from the company, from Activision and its studios was that it's in a minority. You know, people are not really using it. And like, this is some why we feel like it's justified for us to make it much less effective than before. The victim of this optimization are these more, you know, minority play styles that maybe don't have value just on terms of how many people are using these things in the game but maybe they're important for other cases or might just you know, enhance the diversity of what you can do in the game. So uh, I think it's also something that maybe some of the early access collaborations with players are maybe combining using the data, but also combining with listening to feedback on forums and Discord, which suddenly it's giving players more freedom in expressing what they would like from the game, not just by you know, doing things in the game, but also commenting on it. I think that certainly is a more reciprocal way of doing things, that both sides can get something out of it, when it's not just observing kind of quantitatively what people are clicking on in the game, but maybe hearing what people would like to see and how they perceive the things that are in the game. Yeah, as a big fan of single-player narrative-driven games, I would fear that my data is contributing to making games less diverse, in a way, that if the studios see that certain choices in certain games have been taken only by a very small percentage of players that they are not going to invest in such paths or in such content in future games. And just because something is not necessarily seen by many people, it doesn't mean that it has no values. So that's my personal fear as a player whose data is being used and analyzed. I think it's in this context, it's interesting to look at, I think like people were really surprised when Bioware shared the, the statistics for Mass Effect 3 and suddenly people kind of really saw that Ashley and Kaden, these one of the companions in the first game, you have to choose which one survives. But still, these companions, even though they had a very kind of central role in the narrative of the first game, they weren't really popular in, in the following games. Like in the second one, they just appear as a you know as an NPC. In the third game you can play, you have them in your squad again. So it was interesting to see that they really wanted to maintain the continuity and make sure that you know people who are invested in that choice can kind of play it out in the third game, despite the fact that it wasn't really a popular character compared to the other ones. So I think that was an interesting kind of dedication to see it through. I think I've mentioned it a couple of times, you know, and this also this not only applies to microtransactions, but of course, having information about what is popular in the game can help developers to allocate resources. So if you know that this character isn't really that popular, maybe you don't want to record that many voice lines, you know, create that many, you know, unique animations for the character. So yeah, this is definitely the danger is there that the developers might just cut this character out if they see like no one is caring about it. I guess I would say maybe like the saving grace in this case or like the serve lining is that a lot of the single player games tend to be more standalone game experiences. So like if developers find out that something is maybe maybe a character isn't really that popular that it won't really affect the narrative going on because maybe the second game would do something else anyways. But I think there are also examples that maybe if you find out that a certain character is popular, you know, not just by the fact that maybe there's a lot of fan art or discussions about it, maybe people are really spending time in, with the character in the game, then you can feature it in future games. For example, I'm not really sure if this is kind of backed by metrics, but uh, the character of Steph from Life is Strange Before the Storm was in a way became a fan favorite and then appeared in the Life is Strange True Colors. It's not, not a direct sequel, but it's a next game in the series. So we can see maybe also it can also have these impacts, more positive implications. Thank you. That I think gives some of us single peers some hope that our data is not being misused. <laughs> and before we wrap up, Jan, 
I would like to ask you, since you have seen more infographics than most of us probably will throughout our entire lives, and you have been through hundreds or maybe even thousands of them, were there any real standouts? Some that have done things particularly well or particularly badly, or maybe just in an interesting way? Yeah, I think there are like a couple of standouts. I think I was really surprised by this earnest disclosure by Crytek for their Hunt Showdown infographics. I've used this as an epigraph for the article where they're saying to the players and all general audiences that there are some, like we have these obscure statistics that we really don't know what they mean, but wanted to share them with you. So I think it was symptomatic. Having worked also in kind of data analysis for games, I think like sometimes you figure out that you're collecting data for no like specific reason because it's so easy to collect data. And uh, suddenly you feel like, yeah, what, what are we going to do with this? And, you know, sharing it with players might be the only kind of specific cues that you get for this weird stuff that you've been collecting. So I think that's one of my favorites. And I think also Borderlands infographics tend to have you know, these ridiculous comparisons and, you know, it really fits the style of the game and uh, kind of also plays with the conventions that other infographics have introduced and that, you know, try to make these ridiculous numbers, you know, they're ridiculous by nature because so many people are playing the game. So you have millions and billions of, you know, in-game actions that you're trying to convey in the infographic and comparing it to something even more ridiculous is just kind of playing with the absurdity of, what's happening in games. So I think those are also really funny ones. Even the regular statistics that explain how the total playtime of players would be millions of hours or years are completely ridiculous, let alone if you go down the Borderlands route, who I think at one point say that the number of bees that were killed in the game could murder millions and millions of European bees. (laughs) It is absolutely ridiculous and a very creative riff on these infographics and of course we'll have links to all these infographics in the description so viewers and listeners can decide to themselves and we'll include links to Jan's article as well. So Jan, thank you very much for having talked to me. I wish you all the best in your current and in your future research and I would love to have you back to discuss video game monetization or one of the many other topics that you cover within game studies. So Thank you again. Thank you for having me. It was uh, it was so much fun to talk to you.